Srina, thank you so much for coming on to Startup Jira today. I'm really excited to talk to you uh, uh, about Republic, about all of the amazing things that you've done in your career. Um, but before we get into the specifics, let's start with a quick intro. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, of course, and thank you so much for having me on. I think uh, the work of supporting founders as they build companies is one of the most important things that we can all do, right? So thank you Absolutely. so much for, for this opportunity. Uh, so my name is Srina Karani, and I have a bit of a non-traditional background. So I actually, you know, started out as a mechanical engineer. So my background was in building companies these building hardware really on the sort of maker and builder side of things and, and trying to solve really big problems that I thought were important. Um, some of them were successful, some of them were not. And uh, when the last company that I was with, which is actually my brother's company, Sutro, was acquired, uh, I decided that I, I, I didn't know very much about the investing side of things. I never quite understood why investors decided to make a certain decision, decided to invest, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars into specific companies, especially at the early stages. And that's something that I wanted to learn more about. So I uh, was introduced to an early stage uh, venture capital firm called Better Ventures. And I invested with them for a couple of years, helped raise their third fund, and really got into the weeds of what does it mean to invest at the pre-seed, the seed stages, and also help companies as they went on to raise their, you know, Series A, Series B rounds, um, and just learn both about what it meant to raise that type of money to grow your company to that stage, um, but also what decisions it meant on the investment side of the table to actually be able to invest that type of capital. So as uh, I worked for a couple of years in the venture capital industry, I also came to realize so many of the issues that different types of companies and sectors um, that maybe aren't as easily understood and what types of issues that certain founders face, right? There is a huge disparity in the types of capital that is raised, particularly from women, particularly from people of color. Um, and that as a woman of color was something that I personally experienced when I was on the founder side of the table as well. So I, you know, was learning all about investing. I was starting to witness some of the disparities firsthand that the industry really has at large. And I realized that I wanted to be a part of that solution. So I met the CEO of Republic. Uh, his name is Ken Wen, And we had a conversation about venture capital, about the future of it. And he's like, Sharina, this is, this is what I'm trying to change. This is the future that I think can be so much more inclusive, that I think can democratize access to funding, but also to investing. And so how do we sort of shape this new future that can include so many more different types of ideas? We know that there are so many problems in the world. So how do we start, you know, supporting the entrepreneurs that have the solutions to them? And how do we empower more and more people to actually become investors and to have a say in the types of companies that are around them? I mean, even just thinking about as we interface with so many technologies like Google, as you navigate from point A to point B with your G email account as you're sending emails sitting here on zoom right there are so many of these private companies that surround us on a day-to-day -day basis and it's really only when those companies go public that most people have the opportunity to invest and to become some sort of stakeholder but especially at the early stages your vote your your ability to invest with your dollar can be so incredibly powerful so i think on sort of both sides of the table both as an entrepreneur and also as an investor it can be a really compelling case um, to really shape the world around you Absolutely. And so really well said. And the mission of Republic is extremely in line with what we try to do at Startup Sure. Right? So it's fantastic. Um, you know, it's great to have you here and talk about these things. Um, let's talk a little bit about sort of your uh, progression from when you joined Republic. It was a very small, it was essentially a startup at that point. And sort of where it is today is uh, essentially a multinational corporation. So tell us a, a little bit about that progression and the role you played. Uh, through that journey. Yeah, of course. So when I first came on board, uh, when I had that conversation with Ken, I came on as his chief of staff. We were raising a round of funding. Um, we just sort of needed to keep the ship, you know, going in the right direction, keep the lights on, all the engines running, <laughs> all of those metaphors and symbologies that you want to use is where we yep. were at. Um, you know, we'd facilitated a couple of million dollars of capital. We were starting to grow our investor base, but it was still something that people were like, oh, so you're kind of like Kickstarter, you know, kind of like Indiegogo. <laughs> no, we're, 
in one sense, yes, there's the power of community, there's the power of the crowd, but in another sense, it's completely different because this is no longer just a pre-sale, a pre-order, or a donation. This is you making an investment into the future mm -hmm. upside of this company, right? Um, and so over the past couple of years, there's been such a transformation in the company. So going from sort of chief of staff and just keeping all the lights on everything from, you know, helping with business development and getting more and more companies, you know, thinking about different ways that we could do marketing and reach more people um, all the way through to now where we have facilitated over $200 million uh, into early stage companies. We have over a million members who are excited to invest in all different types of companies. And we've now expanded into not only just startups, but you can also invest in crypto. You can invest in, uh, in main street businesses. You can invest in real estate and also video games. And so as you think about investing in all different types of alternative assets, startups are really one of those that are the most high growth, right? There's so mm -hmm. much potential where you invest with you know, just 10 or $100 in the early stages. Um, and that can turn into 10,000 or $100,000 at, at the later stages. And of course, those the steps even grow higher as you exponentially increase the amount that you can invest, right. So I think there's so much opportunity, especially in the startup landscape, that also means that you have to assume the risk of investing in an early stage company. Um, but mm -hmm. I think that's sort of the most compelling part about what we're doing now. And my role as the vice president of business sort of spans across all of those various operations. So from our public facing retail platform where we work with the larger community to invest in startups to our private capital arm to our advisory services. Um, I think there are so much, there's just so much potential for the types of innovation that we can invest in that we can continue to grow and really just shape the future of investing. Absolutely. And the wealth creation piece that you just highlighted for investors is so important because people understand, you know, the stock market and, uh, you know, generating between five and 10 percent per year. Uh, but what you don't realize is that, you know, accredited investors, people who are able to access this uh, market and they, this, this level of investment are talking about five to 10 xing their return, not five to 10 percent. And that's really the engine of wealth creation when you're talking about those higher tiers. Now, I think Republic is, and some of the other organizations are now opening up that market to regular investors and not limiting to you know the top 5% or 10% of the population. So that's extremely exciting. Um, tell us about sort of what the strategies are. I know you had an ICO just recently last year, I believe. Um, so what are some of the main engines that are sort of facilitating that and, uh, uh, you know, helping investors connect with those founders? Yeah, that's a great question. So the way that we work, as I mentioned, we have all these different verticals, right? We have crypto, we have startups, we have uh, real estate, we have Main Street, we have video games. And each of these different types of verticals has different types of investors who are very curious, right? If you're going to ask mm -hmm. me about video game investing, I am not the expert. I am not the person who's going to give you like all those details, right? Same thing with crypto. I'm also not a crypto expert. I've been doing a lot of reading and learning and, you know, you know, getting my feet wet, but I'm also not going to be your expert, right? And so we have different folks who have sort of are leading the charge whether it comes to you know, investing in your local coffee shop that you can do on a debt or revenue share basis all the way through to you know, the next big tech company that is going to be a part of all of our lives in ways that we can't even imagine yet. Right? So it's sort of thinking about that full spread of real estate and Main Street and the more opportunities that people understand a little bit better um, through to really high risk things like crypto. Um, and I think the way that we work with different types of companies really sort of buckets into those areas. So I can focus on startups now. We're also on startup stereo. So I think it exactly. you know, makes the most sense to focus on that area. And that's Absolutely. also my personal area of expertise. Um, but we have a, a, a process where we want to be founder friendly, right? We want to really support and work with entrepreneurs because most of us on the team um, are previous founders. We've started companies ourselves and we know how difficult it is uh, to knock on all those doors to send all those cold emails to get those intros to try to reach people to even take a meeting and then even after the meeting they never get back to you right and so we mm -hmm. we don't want to be that type of funding pathway we want to make sure that we're transparent that we're accountable and that we're working with and alongside the founders and entrepreneurs that we have in our ecosystem and as a part of our family um, to really be able to succeed. So because of that, Republic is actually quite curated. There are other types of um, investing platforms out there um, that are a little bit 
less curated and you know there's an opportunity to raise but republic has a less than three percent acceptance rate in terms of who we work with but an over 90 percent success rate so the, the amount of capital you seek to raise um, over 90 percent of companies have actually hit that number wow. right and so because of that um we you know we don't want to waste entrepreneurs time we know you'd rather be focusing on your business you'd rather be finding pro product market fit finding your next customer building out your pipeline and the last thing you want to be doing is focusing on fundraising and so we want to make that process um, as seamless and as painless as as we can uh, for the founder and because of that um, we are quite curated in terms of who we decide to work with because we've come to better understand our own investor base and we want companies to of course be as successful as possible. That's fantastic. And you're setting up the transition perfectly. Let's talk about those founders. Let's talk about how uh, best they can sort of get ready to come to Republic and how uh, they, what pieces they need to have in place. Um, tell us what that criteria is. You know, it's a very low acceptance rate. How do you determine the, if the company is ready or not? That gets a little bit tricky because we work with so many different types of companies, right? We are sector mm -hmm. and effectively stage agnostic. So one thing that I will say is that we, there is a floor in terms of the types of companies we work with in terms of stage, right? So um, we normally won't work with sort of really idea stage companies, there has to be some sort of product in market that's being validated actively. And most of our companies have around, you know, a minimum of, I'd say 5,000, 5k MRR is where mm -hmm. most of the companies are. A majority of the companies have also raised venture capital uh, prior to working with the public. That is not at all a requirement. Um, it just happens to be the types of companies so far that we're working with. But a lot of companies have either raised just prior to Republic or are raising alongside uh, their public round with us. So there are different types of ways. There's there's no sort of prior funding requirement or anything like that. But it's more of just a company that has a product in market that has some sort of validation. I don't want to necessarily give hard numbers because a B two C company is very different from a B2B company. So two mm -hmm. clients for a B2B company um, it might be the equivalent of, you know, 10,000 users for a B2C company, right? And so it really right. just depends on the sector, depends on the business model and sort of how far along uh, the company is in that space. But I will say that um, showing some evidence of traction is a part of our requirements because that's what investors look for, right? If you're thinking about the average retail investor that doesn't necessarily, you know, spend all of their time vetting companies and investing in companies, then they need something to show as a proof point of this is why this company is going to make it. This is why this company has a future that could 10x right and so as you think about sort of putting that investor cap on and thinking about what's going to make a compelling narrative for investors that's the lens that we take because we want to make sure that it is a company that has a, an upside potential part of Republic's fees is actually a small slice of the investment and so we align ourselves mm -hmm. very much both with the companies we work with but also with our investors because a part of how we make money is that potential upside in the future as well right and so we want to make sure that we are aligned with the companies to be able to raise that capital, not waste their time. But we're also aligned with investors in the sense that we want to select good companies. Right. right. Um, and so around 5K MRR is one of the, you know, not a hard and fast requirement. Once again, it really depends on the sector um, for, you know, uh, an R&D health tech company that is going through FDA approval. They're not generating any revenue whatsoever. Yeah. Right. And so we know that that's going to be, you know, two, maybe even five years down the line. And that's OK, because that's what that sector sort of entails. So really depends on the industry, but showing some evidence of traction if it is going to be, for example, a device that requires FDA approval, um, then showing, you know, prior trials whether it be you know the steps they're taking to actually get that approval or, or, or whatever is the sort of evidence or traction mm -hmm. of their growth and success. That's fantastic. So we're really talking about seed or late seed companies that have the MVP that are in conversation with customers and uh, you know in medical space that's very different from you know a, a pure tech play or something like that to totally understand that. Um, and they're also talking to other investors. So you said angels or VCs that might be investing alongside the funds they're raising in uh, on Republic. So I think those are very clear criteria, very clear guidelines that uh, founders can follow. Um, now, when they are fundraising, as they're going through that process on Republic, 
what can they expect? What, what is the, inter, uh, the interaction like? Uh, so let's say the company did get approval. What can they expect next? Yeah, so there is, uh, so we're talking about you apply, right? So you apply, then you go through our diligence and our investment committee process. Um, so I, for example, sit on our investment committee. And so once that decision gets made, um, then it passes on to our onboarding team. And our, you, have a, you will have a dedicated uh, onboarding campaign manager. And effectively what that means is helping you get set up for success. Because this is a investment offering, because you are offering securities, there are a couple of forms that you have to file with the SEC you have to have gap compliant financials things like that so all that really translates to is you need a cpa and an attorney and they need to make sure that everything about your investment offering is legitimate um, so your onboarding manager helps you through that process effectively translating your pitch deck onto a landing page um, that will be the main place where you're collecting investment helping you you know develop your assets and things like that so you'll have a dedicated onboarding manager as well as a dedicated uh, campaign success manager so someone who's making sure you're doing all the things you need to do uh, to be successful in actually raising that capital and I think that hands-on approach that Republic takes I have to say is probably the reason why we have such a high success rate our onboarding and marketing teams are just some of the smartest people that I've ever worked with um, and also the most kind and the most generous and so being able to sort of leverage their experience as sort of top marketing professionals in their respective industries um, and now they're on Republic helping hundreds of companies at once right um, and so being able to really think through your network think through how do you if you're a CPG company how can you put a QR code on your label so that when someone buys your product, they can scan the QR code and then become, uh, you know, a small you know, investor in your company as well. So what are the different ways that you can leverage um, your company, your network, your brand to be able to raise even more money and help you grow and not just raise that money, but you almost think of it as negative customer acquisition costs, right? So yeah. you're doing this marketing, it's at this inter intersection of marketing and investment. So not only are you taking on investment, but you're also gaining most likely a lifelong customer whose LTV has just expanded beyond your even comprehension <laughs> because they're now an investor and they're gonna tell every single one of their friends about you and make sure that they're only going to use your company into the future, right? And so Absolutely. just thinking about the power of almost psychology of when you're an investor in something and you're invested in that company's success, how that changes your behavior and your connection to that company and how you can use that to really grow your customer base, to grow your exposure, to get PR, to leverage, you know, these hundreds or thousands of investors um, to become startup advisors in a sense, right? You'll, you'll, we have people who have been able to get partnerships and business clients through their investor base, you know, folks who have hired on from their their investors. Um, there's just so many different ways that you can leverage the power of an investor base who is incredibly excited and compelled by your narrative and your story to the point where they've invested in it. Absolutely. And this investor base, unlike some of the angel groups or VCs, this investor base is totally engaged, right? They, they, they're investing in maybe a handful of companies and uh, the companies that they are investing in, they want to follow, make sure that, you know, uh, they, the company is making progress. So their, their sort of value of their equity increases. So that, that's fantastic that, you know, if you can communicate with them, if you can keep them engaged, they become your customer and then they become your lifetime customer. So uh, really, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of strategies there. Um, what is before the actual investment is made? Um, are the investors able to communicate with the founder and uh, you know ask questions, uh, do their own due diligence? What, what is that process like for an outside investor looking at a company on Republic? Yeah, of course. So on, so we call it the deal page. So it's effectively the pitch deck that's turned itself into an interactive page where you can learn more, watch videos, sort of interact with the founder. There's actually a very, dis, you know, robust discussion section. Um, so a lot of investors are sort of even answering their own questions and working with each other. And also we really encourage our founders to be very active in that. So basically a question that's asked by one investor becomes information that's accessible to everyone because it's sort of through this forum based 
discussion effectively about the deal itself that's by investors and for investors um, and responded to by the founders and entrepreneurs themselves. So whether you have a question about the market size, um, hopefully the deal page has already covered that, but you know, it could be a nuance of the go to market strategy. It could be, you know, trying to understand the revenue numbers better. It could be learning more about the team, whatever your question might be. Um, there is a place to effectively ask those questions and to immediately get responses from the founders as well. So we really encourage a lot of those conversations because we see people ask questions and say, all right, I'm convinced, you know, I'm going to invest $500 now, right? Right. And I think um, it, it just creates a lot of momentum and a lot of energy around your fundraise as well in, in ways that are sort of not possible without this type of capital raise. Absolutely. And that uh, interaction is so important for the founders to sort of get comfortable on the platform uh, with the investors that are coming through and vice versa, right? Um, what is what does that uh, time frame look like? How long do, do, are the startups normally on the platform, fundraising, you know, actively interacting with investors? What can they expect as far as the time commitment goes? Yeah, so in one sense, it's similar to a VC round, um, except with just a little bit more, I'd say a little bit more of an assurance of success um, <laughs> in the sense that you are preparing your campaign the same way you'd effectively prepare your pitch deck and get all your materials together, you know, create your P&Ls and whatever sort of equivalent of a data room that you put together for an investor. Um, so you're effectively preparing all of those materials as a part of the onboarding phase. As soon as the investment's live, um, you can kind of think of it as like, getting your round together, right, with, with angels or VCs. So you're, you're trying to find your lead investor, you're trying to um, identify different folks who would be able to come in. And the timeline is effectively the same on Republic. So the first part of the campaign is where you are just reaching your community. And so uh, we encourage founders to really use their friends and family, use their networks, use their customer bases to be able to drive that initial signaling that this is going to be a company that is able to raise from people who know Know them well and from people who, who are excited and are sort of the, the early adopters of what the team is trying to build. And as soon as the company hits $25,000, then it gets pushed out to the larger Republic community. And so um, the, the company often, you know, gets a launch email, they're able to get all these different types of things, which in, in and of themselves, because we have such a large base, can sometimes drive hundreds of thousands of dollars, right, just through, through a series of emails. And um, the company timeline really depends on how much they're trying to raise, how long they want to keep it open for, and uh, when they sort of want to just be done fundraising and get on with building their companies. Um, and so on average, the companies can expect to, to, to be live for fundraising, I'd say, you know, between 30 to 90 days, uh, really depending on how powerful of a community they have, right? Some, some campaigns have literally sold out within hours of, uh, of the fundraise going live. Um, right. Some of them take three months to actually be able to, you know, hit the amount that they want to hit. And so right. it, I think it really depends on the power of the community um, that the founders sort of bringing to the table and how that can sort of continue to drive momentum. Um, and then how much they're trying to raise and how quickly that can happen. So I'd say between 30 to 90 days um, is, is the range that most companies should think about. Um, but Republic can work with you, whether you want to keep it open longer and as sort of that intersection, like I mentioned, of almost a marketing and a fundraising play, where if you have it open longer, you can continue to sort of engage your investor base in that, or sorry, engage your customer base to become your investor base. Um, or if you just you know want to get done quickly, you already have all the capital lined up and you just don't want to deal with the paperwork and then your Republic's your, your sort of fundraising solution. Right. Absolutely. And, and that could be, you know, uh, uh, one to three months is usually the due diligence period for a normal VC fund. So <laughs> it's nothing out of the ordinary, right? That time frame. Exactly. Um, now, let's talk about how much, you know, capital uh, a company can raise on Republic. Obviously, that depends on, you know, if it's at seed stage or if it's more advanced series A, B, etc. But um, if, let's say, a company had a goal of raising, let's say, 500000 uh, and it's only getting up to 250, 300, and it's starting to lose traction um, versus a company that hits its target or gets oversubscribed. Um, is there any sort of limitation on what you know the minimum is for a company as far as funding goes? Or if uh, you know if it is uh, uh, getting oversubscribed, do you stop it at a certain point or do you let it uh, get oversubscribed? What's sort of the guideline as far as funding goes? 
Yeah, there's a couple of pieces. So one of them is that there are federal regulations around this, right? So this is a part mm -hmm. of the JOGS Act under Regulation CF, and the rules just changed back in March to originally it was $1 million that you could raise from, from Regulation CF, and now it's $5 million. So yep. the the federal cap, and that's a republic also has to abide by, is $5 million. So that that's sort of the top amount that you that's can... That's the hard cap. Right. Exactly. That is a hard cap sort of across the base um, for every calendar year that you can raise under Regulation CF. Now, now, just to be clear, that doesn't include a VC round. So if you're raising $5 million on Republic and you want $3 million from you know, VCs, that's under Regulation D, you can actually do both regulations in parallel. So that's what a lot of companies do is they raise a, a, a certain amount of their allocation on Republic and then have um, a VC or an angel or some, some other group of investors to be able to raise more if they need to raise more than that five. The average okay. raise on Republic is 500K. So half a million dollars um, is our, our, our average raise for the, the last cycle when we, when we measured our averages. And so that number is sort of what we try to target for companies. It's like, let's see how we can get you to 500K. But once again, it really depends on a company. If it's an early stage company that has some angel investors lined up, um, I would say it's not necessarily worth going through if you have a you know a, a, another network or other folks that you can tap into um i think the minimum raise that we sort of try to get most founders to get to is 100k i think if it's under a hundred thousand dollars it's not that it's not worth it in terms of your time or money um but you might just be able to get it through means where you have a couple of friends or a couple of you know angel investors that can write five or ten k checks um and maybe that process is just easier for you right and so I think that 100K is sort of the, the baseline that we try to get most companies to. 500K is the average, 5 million is the cap. So that's sort of the spectrum that, that we work within. And then you do have to meet whatever minimum it is that you say that you want to meet in order to actually be able to unlock um, the capital. So let's say you uh, want to hit 100K and that's sort of your, your target minimum, um, but you haven't hit that 100k then that money does get returned to investors got it so your goal might be 500k but if your minimum is 100k and you haven't hit it then it really is not there's no point on actually giving you that funding because you won't be able to achieve your business objective Exactly. And that's a part of our de-risking the types of companies that we work with, right? We also understand that investing in early stage companies is incredibly risky. Um, and a lot of the investors in our, our base are not full-time investors. They're not folks who do this for a living and don't necessarily have the time to do all the diligence. So in a sense, they're sort of looking to Republic to have that curated platform um, and sort of trust us to do some of that, you know, basic legwork for them. Um, and because of that, we want to make sure that we retain a higher quality and if you're not able to meet a certain amount, which means that your runway isn't as extended as you thought it might be, um, and that means your business is going to shut down in two months, that's probably a really risky investment for investors. And so um, we really try to do our diligence to make sure that the investors that are on our uh, platform um, understand the types of companies that we work with. And therefore, you know, we can ensure success of the companies, but we can also make sure that investors are protected as well. Absolutely. So I'm going to come back to the founders and ask you my final question, uh, which is sort of the action step. But before we do, what's next for Republic? I mean, you guys have had tremendous success. Um, where are you hoping to take the company over the next several years? Yeah, so the future of Republic, I think I've alluded this to a few times, but we are trying to become the go-to investment platform, right? So regardless whether it's startups or any other type of asset class, we want to be the one place where you can sort of manage your entire portfolio. We really try to help investors build out a diversified portfolio, um, but then also be, have a very straightforward way that founders and entrepreneurs can work with us as well, right? So we want to make sure that we're solving problems for both sides of the ecosystem. And I think that means that the future of Republic is very much going to be a communities play, right? So how do we continue to go further in the direction of making fundraising for legitimate, viable companies as easy and straightforward as possible and allow investors to come in as quickly as possible? So um, that includes an expansion into different types of asset classes. Um, I think it also includes uh, thinking about different ways that we can work with other geographies. Currently, Republic 
public is registered in the US and uh, per all the rules and regulations, um, the companies that we work with also have to be US companies, right? But the, the market is so much larger. So what exactly does that mean to be able to support companies coming in um, really across all different types of sectors, all different types of geographies, and, and what does that mean for Republic? Um, but I think our future is very ambitious and our team is very ambitious. And so it's just thinking through um, what is the, the best roadmap to actually getting there. But I think being the go-to one-stop shop for all different types of investing, um, whether it be from real estate all the way through startups through to crypto, um, we want to be that platform for everyone. Absolutely, absolutely. And when you start to expand globally, there are so many amazing ecosystems for startups, including India, China, Middle East, Europe, uh, uh, where all of these Africa, where all of these new companies are coming out of. So absolutely, that's a huge market that you guys are going after. And then obviously the investors from all of those areas as well. So that, that'll be uh, a, a, a lot of sort of regulations and a lot of other things that you sort of have to process before you can be in those markets. Um, so fantastic. So let's end with, uh, with my final question that I like to ask all of the investors, um, which is what is the one thing that you look for in a company? What is the most important thing without which you won't even consider uh, a startup coming onto your platform? Uh, and, and what is that for you? What do you like to see uh, a, a CEO bring to the table on that first meeting, uh, which sort of gets you excited about the company? Yeah, I love this question because I think, you know, you think through all the different types of uh, traits that you look for from a company, you think about traction, you think about team, the market size, the market opportunity, uh, competitive advantage, there are all these things that you sort of take into the calculation. But for me, specifically, it comes down to two things. Um, and first and foremost is traction, right? It's what have you done to validate your idea? And the reason why I think that's so important is not because of the traction itself or what specific number or threshold that you meet, but it's because that is a reflection of the founding team. It is a reflection of how scrappy are you? How can you figure out the best ways to validate and quickly iterate and quickly develop your concept and your vision and future for for what you think your company can be and how that traction and the way that you've approached getting that sort of validation and testing your concept in the market I think that is the most powerful indicator for what a founder is going to do and how they're going to approach you know growing their company at large and so for me it's these you know it's not the traction itself. It's not the specific numbers they hit. It's not a specific revenue amount or anything like that. Um, but is what have they done? What are they continuing to do to show that the market needs their product? It needs their solution because they are solving something big and powerful. And the fact that they can take the steps to actually start to get some feedback, start to develop out and continue. It's a little bit of a, a cheat answer. I gave you two and one, um, but I think the, the traction is definitely one of those big pieces for me that is such an indicator of how a company is going to continue to approach building our sort of offering to the world. Absolutely. No, that's, that's such a great point. And one word that you used in that answer that really sticks out for me is being scrappy. And a lot of people look at it in a very negative way, but for me as an investor, I look at it in a, you know, in the best way possible where, you know, if you can take even a, a PowerPoint presentation and go talk to a customer and say, hey, would you buy this? Can you sign a letter of in, uh, intent? Um, to me, that shows that you have the capability to go out there and actually work uh, uh, with your uh, customer and develop the product. Um, versus people who, you know, say, oh, well, we're going to develop this $5 million um, uh, social media marketing campaign, but they haven't spent the first dollar uh, testing the market. Uh, to me, that, that, that word scrappy really stands out. Um, so, uh, no, thank you so much for coming on. Any final thoughts that you'd want to leave our founders with and, and any information about Republic that we haven't covered so far? Yeah, of course. Well, thank you again so much for this opportunity and for all the work that you're doing to support founders. I think it's the most important thing we can do. So um, the is when you are thinking about fundraising and building your company, um, 
to really remember and focus on what's best for you and what is best for your company, right? Not every funding pathway is the same, not every business model and type of company in the sector is the same. And so to sort of take all the different advice you get with a grain of salt and remember that you know what's best for your company um, and to make sure that you are consistently thinking about what is best for you and what is best for your company and the way that you wanna build that company. So um, best of luck to anyone and everyone building something on their own. I know it's not an easy journey, but um, I think it's, it's one of the most uh, satisfying and uh, fulfilling journeys that you can possibly be on. So Fantastic. And that's such a great thought to leave everybody with. Uh, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story with us. I really appreciate you. Uh, and, and let's continue the conversation and see how else we can work together to continue to add value to our ecosystem. Thanks again, Trina.